the damage this could do is like not worth falling in love with reading again, right? Like if this book is going to harm someone mentally and emotionally and cause them to idealize and abusive relationships, it would be better that they not read at all, right? <laughs> Hello, thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today I will be talking about It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover. So I read Verity by Colleen Hoover in 2022 and I made a book rant review video for it. And it's not the best video I've ever made and I certainly wasn't the most articulate or eloquent in my issues with that book. However, it's the video that's done the best on my channel, which is kind of crazy. You know, it's always weird which video takes off and it's, it's often the ones that you don't even have that high of hopes for and then somehow they end up doing really well. But anyway, after that video, I also read Layla later in the year because someone recommended it and there were certain plot details with Layla that I thought were better executed. For the most part, based on those two books, I just didn't think Colleen Hoover was a very good writer. And I also had issues because in both books, we have relationships, romantic relationships that Hoover is wanting us to be rooting for. And yet they have some major issues. And if she was writing about like clearly a toxic relationship that is meant to be seen as unhealthy, then that's fine. Like show an unhealthy relationship, but don't write an unhealthy relationship, but do it in a way that the audience is meant to find it romantic, which brings to mind like the movie, The Notebook, right? Where some of the things the guy does in the notebook it's like wow like that's a huge red flag and that's super messed up and that's a toxic trait and yet at the time of the notebook everybody thought it was so romantic and oh and so when it romanticizes toxic traits right and so in Layla the couple that ends up together in the end it's supposed to be seen as like a good thing but there were just so many issues with that relationship and then Verity had all kinds of relationships plus that plus that was just such a stupid story and yeah in general I just don't think Hoover is just a good writer. But yeah, so after Layla, I had zero interest in reading any other Colleen Hoover books ever again. But then with Cindy made a video about Verity saying like her issues with it, which was very entertaining and I enjoyed it. Uh, but then in her mid-year freakout tag, she talked about It Ends With Us and how it was a surprise because after Verity, she had very low expectations for it, but then she actually really liked it and she was saying good things about it. And so because Cindy liked it, I was like, okay, I'm gonna check this out because now I need to know like what she's talking about. And the fact that she liked it so much made me finally be willing to read it. And while there are things about this book that I really like and admire, and Hoover has an afterword where she shares her reason for writing the book, which I really appreciated, which I will get into. At the same time though, it's just, again, a poorly written book. And even though she has a good message to it, there's just so much wrong with the book that the message in some ways can kind of be lost and people can misinterpret things. And so I just wanted to make this video just getting into my own issues with it and why I think it is also a problematic book. But I also recently read Big Little Lies. And so in the second half of this video, I am going to get into comparing Big Little Lies and It Ends With Us because both of, both of them deal with domestic abuse. And I think Big Little Lies deals with this topic so much better. So in the second half of this video, I'm gonna talk about the two of them and why I prefer Big Little Lies. And I'm going to keep it spoiler free when I discuss Big Little Lies. There might be light spoilers for Big Little Lies, but even if you have not read that book yet, I am not gonna be giving away any of the main spoilers per se. But if you do want to hear me talk about spoilers for Big Little Lies, I was recently on the Ink to Film podcast and YouTube channel and we talked about the second half of Big Little Lies, the book and the TV show. So we really go in depth into that. So you should definitely check it out. I will link to it in up above as well as down in the description. So definitely check out that video and subscribe to Ink to Film. And getting right into It Ends With Us, which right from the start, I'm gonna be getting into spoilers. There is no spoiler-free section for this book in today's video, so. But Hoover's goal for this book was to accurately show an abusive relationship and to specifically just so show all the complexities within the relationship and show why the abused person will stay. And yet, even though she's trying to like give an accurate representation of this, I feel like the accuracy is kind of lost when there are so many inaccurate, unrealistic things throughout the entire book. And so it kind of dampens the message, even though it is a good message, you know, to start with the things that are just unrealistic and inaccurate and that just are a distraction. First of all, Colleen Hoover gives her characters some of the stupidest names. Yeah, like Lily Bloom is the name of this character and she owns a flower shop. And then we have Ryle Kincaid and then we have Atlas Corrigan. And then in Layla, there was a character named Leeds Gabriel. <laughs> and she just gives her characters these ridiculous names that 
are just a distraction, like I said, and that it just bothers me. In Verity, we have a character named Verity, which again is just such a out there kind of a name. I think the other people in Verity had fine names though. But yeah, so she gives characters just these ridiculous names that just is a pet peeve of mine because it's just like, what the heck? Like, who has a name like this? And then on top of that, every character in this book is in their 20s. The oldest people are like 29, while Lily, the youngest, is 23. And Lily is a 23-year-old who opens up a flower shop that is like immediately successful. And then you have Ryle Kincaid, who is a 29-year-old neurosurgeon. And then you have Marshall and Alyssa who are like 28 and 29. And they are multi-millionaires because Marshall created this app. And so now, like she mentions at one point that they made $6 million in that year. So they're crazy rich. And then you have Atlas who is like 25 and he has this super successful, super popular restaurant in Boston. So all of them are just like ridiculously successful and rich. Like, like why doesn't she just work at a flower shop? Or why doesn't Atlas, why isn't he just like the head chef at a restaurant <laughs> and Ryle being a 29 year old neurosurgeon like they're all just too rich and too successful and speaking of Lily's flower shop again this might be a nitpick but her idea for the flower shop is supposed to be like so unique and different and it shows why she's so successful and it's because she does like the opposite of what you expect in a flower shop and so <laughs> I'm just gonna share a quote sharing her idea for this flower shop. And she says, what if instead of showcasing the sweet side of flowers, we showcase the villainous side. Instead of pink accents, we use darker colors like a deep purple or even black. And instead of just spring and life, we also celebrate winter and death. We'll still give them what they want, of course, but we'll also give them what they don't know they want. Someone once told me that there is no such thing as bad people. We're all just people who sometimes do bad things. That stuck with me because it's so true. We've all got a little bit of good and evil in us. I want to make that our theme. Instead of painting the walls a putrid sweet color, we paint them dark purple with black accents. And instead of only putting on the usual pastel displays of flowers and boring crystal vases that make people think of life, we go edgy, brave and bold. We put out displays of darker flowers wrapped in things like leather or silver chains. And rather than put them in crystal vases, we'll stick them in black onyx or I don't know, purple velvet vases lined with silver studs. And then on top of that, going along with uh, the wealth of these characters, we also have two characters who are ridiculously rich and yet they get these minimum wage jobs just because they're bored. And with Alyssa, so Alyssa is the sister of Ryle and her husband is the one who created the app. So they're millionaires. And with her, maybe it makes a bit more sense. But then there's this other character who's crazy rich and he just decides to be a valet at uh, Atlas's restaurant. And it's just kind of like, okay, if someone was crazy successful with something and they became rich, rather than just filling their boring days with a minimum wage job, <laughs> they would probably, like the way their mind works, I would think in most cases, they would move on to the next thing and find something else that has like more interest to them and that they're more passionate about and that they end up being successful with probably yet again in some ways, you know? And so it's like, if someone was able to achieve something so big, chances are they're not gonna go from that to working a minimum wage job. It just <laughs> doesn't seem accurate or realistic. And then yeah, going back to Alyssa, she is Ryle's sister. And I feel like we should have learned more from her because I feel like her perspective would have been really interesting to have a brother who is physically abusive to his girlfriend and to one, like how much did she know about his issues? And then two, like when she finds out the full scope of his issues, like I just think that would have been really interesting to hear from her perspective. Uh, but then another character I wanted to mention is poor Devin, who is like the token gay friend who shows up in one scene, never to be seen again. <laughs> and so that too was just kind of like, okay, there's just like a lot of different uh, cliches in this book and he ends up being one of them. And then to get into Ryle, so Hoover said that she wrote Ryle in the, like the first half of the book. She wanted him to be someone really likable and someone that the reader falls for just as Lily falls for. But honestly, like right from the start, he has all kinds of issues, which again goes back to Layla, how there is that relationship that is so unhealthy. And yet Hoover writes it as if it's romantic. And that's what she does with Ryle. Like in some ways, all these red flags with Ryle in the first half makes sense because he does have issues. But Hoover isn't writing it thinking she's writing red flags. She writes it thinking she's writing this romantic guy. And so it seems like there's just 
like, does she not know how to write a healthy relationship? Because even with Atlas, who we'll get into, there's issues there too. And yet the issues are shown as being romantic rather than being the unhealthy, toxic issues that they are, you know? Uh, but for example, early on, Ryle, they meet and he wants to have sex with her and have a one night stand, but she doesn't want to have a one night stand. She wants like an actual relationship. So they don't sleep together. And then later in the book, he comes to her door and he tells her that he knocked on 29 doors. He went through the floors one by one of her apartment building Building until he found her and he did all of that work just to try to convince her to have a one night stand with him. And honestly, a guy being like, please, can we just do it one time? That way I can just get you out of my head and I can move on with my life. Like that is not romantic. That is a jerk move and it's so degrading and it's so disgusting. And how could anyone think that that's romantic? And I'm just going to read this section of the book, which says, please, he says, I'm really good at it, Lily. You'll barely even have to do any work. I try not to laugh, but his determination is, a, is as endearing as it is annoying. Good night, Ryle. He suddenly drops to his knees in front of me. He wraps his arms around my waist. Please, Lily, he says through self-deprecating laughter. Please have sex with me. He's looking at, up at me with puppy dog eyes and a pathetic, hopeful grin. I want you so, so bad, and I swear once you have sex with me, you'll never hear from me again, I promise. There's something about a neurosurgeon literally on his knees begging for sex that does me in. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like... Oh my gosh, like, like I said, a guy who has that attitude, like that is not a compliment to the woman he wants to be with. That is an insult and it is degrading and it is disgusting and a huge red flag, right? Like if that's supposed to be seen as something that's like, oh, that's like so charming or something like, no, that is not charming at all. And like I said, if Hoover wrote this intending it to be an obvious red flag, then fine. But I don't, she wrote it because she says in the afterward that she wrote Ryle throughout the first part in a likable way, she says. And so clearly that means she thought this was him being likable, I guess. And so just so many issues with that. Which by the way, if this was written as Ryle having these red flags and Lily being drawn to these red flags, and like maybe there's part of her that realizes it's problematic and yet she's drawn to this problematic relationship, that would make sense because she comes from like an abusive childhood. So it makes sense that she would fall for a guy who has a lot of issues. But again, it's not written that way. <laughs> it's written as if Lily is like, you know, in a healthy place. And this guy is just being really charming by begging her for sex. And it like wins her over is how it's written, which is, yeah, just really frustrating and gross. And then things also move incredibly fast with them, which again is shown as being like, oh, so romantic. And then Ryle goes as someone who is, he's like 29 years old and he has never in his life had a serious relationship. And he goes from never having a serious relationship, only one night stands, to suddenly doing a complete 180. And not only does he want a serious relationship with Lily, within a few months, he wants to marry her. He wants to have a family with her. And suddenly his dreams of being the top neurosurgeon the world and moving to a different state suddenly he doesn't care and he's like oh we can stay in boston that's fine like i i my career doesn't matter that much to me anymore and just like that he's like a new person all because of lily lily brings this out in him and suddenly he's just like the perfect guy who wants to be committed and have a family even though for the last like 29 years of his life he hadn't wanted that and now suddenly he does so again it doesn't seem realistic and then continuing with the unrealistic aspects of ryle so his backstory as to why he gets abusive. Uh, it's because when he was six years old, he accidentally shot and killed his brother. And so that traumatic event caused him to now like have these blackout moments where he doesn't remember what he's doing and he gets violent apparently. And he says he's been to therapy, but you know, that's just the way it is. And honestly, I would rather have had Hoover not try to explain Ryle's actions at all, rather than have her come up with some story that is just so ridiculous and also very uncommon, right? Like I feel like domestic abuse is common enough and it happens with people who have like a very normal reason, a normal background that leads them to be the way they are, you know? And so she didn't need to come up with some crazy story that's so extreme about a boy accidentally shooting his brother. She could have come up with something, like she didn't have to come up with anything, but it would have been more realistic, I think, to have had Ryle be raised in an abusive household. And so he sees his parents be violent. And even if he tr tries not to be that way, you know, maybe it's like in his subconscious from being raised around it, you know? Or it could have been something else. I don't know, but it didn't have to be something so extreme and so ridiculous 
ridiculous. It seemed ridiculous in my mind, at least. And then we do have, you know, Hoover talks about her own father and how he struggled with alcoholism and that kind of led him to be abusive. And so we do see that with Ryle. I think like two of the three times he is drinking, but I think one of the times he's sober and she doesn't make a clear link between the alcohol and the abuse. But still, Ryle, if he was actually trying to work on himself, then I feel like stopping substances such as alcohol is like an obvious step to take, right? So if he really cared and was really trying to improve, then he would be getting sober. <laughs> but by the end of the book, like that's not even talked about. Like it doesn't seem like he's working that hard to change his ways. And when she met him, like I said, he claims to have done therapy, but obviously it didn't work. So clearly you need to find a new therapist and clearly you need to be working harder and doing something to stop this from happening because obviously whatever tactics you were using before aren't working. And by the end of the book, she's like co-parenting with Ryle because there is this ridiculous pregnancy side plot. But anyway, and she lets her daughter, her baby be alone with Ryle. But honestly, like if Ryle is not showing that he is taking actions to better himself, like how could you even let your daughter be alone with him? Like I, like if I were Lily, I would have to know that Ryle is like going to therapy. He is getting sober. He is like making these concrete, cha concrete changes in his life to stop this pattern he's in. Cause up until now, like he's not doing anything to stop the pattern. And she's just trusting him to not be abusive with his child. And also like, just because they're not in a relationship anymore, doesn't mean that he couldn't still lash out at her at times. And so the ending makes it seem like, oh, they had to get a divorce, but now that they're divorced, you know, they can co-parent and it'll all be fine. And it's, it just ends like too neatly when it wouldn't be that neat. And as if Ryle, like his issues are fine because they only came up when they were in a like romantic relationship. And now that they're not, it's not gonna be a problem anymore. But first of all, like Ryle eventually is gonna date someone else and these issues are just gonna come up again in his next relationship. And two, Lily, just because she is no longer with Ryle, it doesn't mean that she is now going to have issues in her next relationship because she also is not working on herself at all either. Like clearly she has her own mental and emotional issues that she needs to address. And by not addressing them, she's just gonna go from one bad relationship to the next, which leads me to talk about Atlas. So he is the good guy in the story and the one we're supposed to be rooting for. And the romantic relationship with Atlas is supposed to be the example of like the healthy relationship and the guy we want her to be with. And again, it makes sense that growing up in an abusive household as a 15 year old, she would be drawn to this 18 year old homeless kid who has his own trauma going on, you know? But again, it's not shown as like, oh, these two broken people are drawn to each other. I mean, it kind of is shown like that, but it's not shown as being unhealthy and that they're drawn to each other's drama in a way. Instead, it's shown as being like so romantic and sweet. But he was 18 and she was 15. And I get that's only a three year age gap, but the issue isn't the age gap. The issue is that the younger person is so young. She's 15 years old. That's crazy young. She's so naive. She and an 18 year old should not <laughs> be getting romantic with a 15 year old. And he does wait till she's 16 before where they finally are like intimate, which I is I guess is supposed to be admirable of him to wait. But like I said, he was 18 and he just shouldn't have been getting physically involved with a 15 year old or a 16 year old. And also he says he is waiting to go into the Marines and he's waiting till he's 19, but that makes zero sense. Like you're legally an adult right now. So what's stopping you from joining the Marines? Like. Why are you here? Why are you homeless? Like go in the brains, you're an adult. You can do what you want. And so it's never explained why he waits. <laughs> and so that was a huge plot hole right there because once you're 18, you could have joined. What are you waiting for? So yeah, in their teenage romance years, there's definitely some unhealthy things going on between the two of them, but it's just seen as being like, oh, so romantic and young love and Atlas is just so good to her. And then flash forward into the future when they meet each other and he sees that Ryle has hurt her, he gives her his number and he's like, you know, I hope you never have to call me, but here's my number in case you do. And then of course she does end up calling him. And that whole thing of her of Atlas saving her essentially and having, she has his house to go stay at and she just conveniently has this past lover who is now rich and hot and single and she has him to go run to is just a very annoying trope. And that again is something that I think is very cliche and it romanticizes being rescued from abuse, you know? And so I don't like that at all. And also the Atlas love story, including the past, like their teenage romance, that was not necessary to the story. And then her being rescued by Atlas, it all just detracts from what should be the focus of this book. And she should be the one 
who just rescues herself and also Colleen Hoover. So her mom was abused by her dad and the mom leaves the dad and she has no resources. And Hoover says how like it was a really tough time the first few years. And I would have loved to have seen that in this book because Lily, she has millionaire friends and she has, like I said, she has Atlas she can turn to. And I would have preferred a story where things weren't so convenient and where she didn't have a guy who was saving her essentially. And even though, I mean, it takes a while for her to get with Atlas. So it's not like she goes from one guy to the next, he still saves her from the situation. And I just don't like that at all. And she should have, I mean, yeah, sure. She could have relied on her mom and that would have been better than having her rely on some other guy. And the whole thing about how like, oh, Atlas and I are just interconnected and will always be that way. Like that just <laughs> bothers me. I don't know if that would be considered codependent or something, but it's like, okay, just because he was with you for a few months when you were 15 and he was the first guy you were ever with, like now you just have this forever connection to him or something you can't let each other go. And I just find that to be pretty cheesy and cliche and unromantic. And also the fact that, so Atlas and Lily, when they're teenagers, their relationship has a lot of drama because one, he is homeless and she is helping him. And two, she has her dad who is abusive going on. And so this whole situation, this whole relationship is built on a lot of trauma and drama. And the fact that neither of them, we don't see Lily ever going to therapy or doing anything. Atlas, I don't know. But now that she is getting with Atlas in the very end of this book, once she leaves Ryle, who's to, like their relationship will probably now have some other kind of drama in it because that's what they know, right? And she broke one cycle, sure, but she didn't do enough to completely break the cycle because she could just go into this relationship with Atlas. And if there's no drama going on, the two of them, one or the other, could start causing drama because it's what they're familiar with and they're uncomfortable with a boring relationship without drama, right? And that's what happened. That's what happens when people are raised in abusive households. They crave these toxic relationships that are full of drama. And sometimes they create the drama themselves because it's what they're familiar with. And so until you do that work on yourself, it doesn't matter if you break up with one person, you're just going to end up with someone else who gives you the drama that you crave, or you will provide the drama that you crave. And so that whole aspect was just not addressed at all in this book. And I did want to talk about the fact that one of the reasons books like this annoy me so much is because I know that myself, when I was a teenager and in my early adulthood, I would have found this romantic and I would have been into the Atlas romance and I would have wanted her to forgive Ryle, which you hear so many people online talk about this book being like, oh, I felt so bad for Ryle and I wanted her to forgive him because he really was a good guy. It wasn't his fault. And that totally would have been me. <laughs> and so I had a lot of unhealthy ideas about relationships. And so I know if I'd read this book, it would have had a negative impact on me. And I know a lot of people say Colleen Hoover, like they read one of her books and it's the first book that got me into reading again. And so I just love her book so much. But honestly, I think <laughs> like the damage it could potentially do, especially to young readers, or even if they're not young, but just someone who has an unhealthy state of mind, the damage this could do is like not worth falling in love with reading again, right? Like if this book is gonna harm someone mentally and emotionally and cause them to idealize an abusive relationships, it would be better that they not read at all, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, I just, books like this just really bother me because of that reason. And again, that goes for the Atlas storyline as well as the Ryle storyline. But even with Ryle, we see him be physically abusive like three times. But even that, I feel like it's a very simplistic view of an abusive relationship and it doesn't fully get into more of the complexities that would go on there. And granted, they aren't together for very long, so maybe that's part of it. But yeah, and then the storyline with Atlas of like, oh, she kind of rescued him to start because he was homeless. And then later on, he rescues her and it's all about drama. That's what their relationship is based on. And then to end, I want to talk about Big Little Lies, like I said. And so Big Little Lies, we have the characters of Celeste and Perry who are have been married for like, I don't know how long, but their kids are five years old. So they've been married for over five years and they are in a, an abusive relationship and they are caught in this cycle. And that book shows so well as to why Celeste stays married to, stays married to Perry because similar to Ryle, he is very charismatic and he is very charming and he is a great dad and he has all of, he's very handsome and he has all of these traits that Celeste admires and so it makes it hard to leave him even though he hits her and she also like sees the power dynamic between them is when he hurts her she has more power for a while and so just this perceived power dynamic that goes on and how she feels like she sees the full scope of him like it's not just a man who hits his wife like there's more to him than that and there's more goodness there but then I like that in the end of the book we kind of realize that 
none of that was real. Like this power, this power balance she thinks exists is just a perceived balance of power and it's not actually the way she thinks it is. And she thinks she sees the full scope of Perry, but turns out she doesn't. And she never really knew him as well as she thought she did. And also uh, Leanne Moriarty never tries to explain why Perry is the way he is. And so I do like that because again, I'd rather have them not try to explain it than to try to explain it away with a stupid reason. And also the book, like Celeste and Perry, like you see why she stays and you can empathize with her, but you are never left sympathizing for Perry being like, oh, she should just forgive him. And oh, by the end of the book, like I still liked him. Like by the end of the book, like you realize he is a huge piece of trash and Celeste needs to not be with him. And so I do realize that there are people who can change their ways. Like I said, if Ryle or even Perry, which Perry talks about how, you know, we see how so often he's like, I'm going to get help. I'm going to change. But all he does is make these empty promises and never follows through. So if Perry or Ryle actually follow through and did the work and, you know, they could potentially change, but despite their potential for change, like right now in this moment, there is nothing that can excuse that kind of behavior and nothing can justify it. And yeah, maybe in the future they'll change, but that doesn't mean Celeste needs to stick by his side and wait for it to happen and risk her own life in the process, you know? And then I also like in Big Little Lies how we see how it affects their children. And so, you know, and it ends with us, she's constantly like, oh, like he wouldn't hurt his child and my dad never hurt me. He just hurt my mom. But it doesn't show how that affects you emotionally, right? And Big Little Lies, Perry is never abusive to his children and his children never witness the, the abuse. They are still affected by living in a home where this violence happens. And this book shows that really well too about how the children are affected affected, even if the parents don't think they see or hear the children, are still impacted by this. And it ends with us. It does have that moment where after their baby is born, it's a girl, and that's when she tells him she wants a divorce. And she's like, if your daughter came to you and said a man like pushed her down the stairs, what would you tell her? Like you would tell her to get away from him. You wouldn't tell her to give him another chance. And so that's when Ryle realizes that like, yeah, they have to divorce essentially, which in some ways I thought that was a good moment, you know, just having him get that perspective. And then we also have when she talks to her mom near the end of the book too, and she thinks her mom is going to defend Ryle because the mom stayed in a relationship with an abusive guy her whole life until the husband died. But the mom doesn't. And she tells her instead, like, you know, you got to put your foot down. And when you draw a line, you need to stick to that basically because the mom kept drawing a line, but then she just kept moving the line and putting up with more and more. And so I did think this book had its merits, of course. And I do like the message and I did like the afterward by Colleen Hoover. And yeah, there's a lot of good parts. For example, how Ryle gets violent because he's jealous of Atlas, but how like that's not justified though. And she's even like, you know, you could have found me in bed, you know, having sex with Atlas. And even then you wouldn't have been justified in physically hurting me. But then at the same time, uh, the book is... Like I said, like it's a very simplified view, I think. Despite at times her trying to show the complexities for the most part, it just doesn't get enough into the complexities, I don't think. But she does show how it's difficult to stop this cycle of abuse and this cycle that you're, you know, the familial cycle you are in. It can be hard to break that chain and how Hoover, her mom is the one who broke that chain and how much she admires her mom for doing that and for having the bravery to put an end to it. And it was scary. And so I do like that. And again, I wish with Lily there would have been, we would have seen more about how scary and daunting this was because we see how it's hard for her because she still loves Ryle. But I don't know, like I said, with her finances being so good and then with her having Atlas, it just wasn't the stark reality enough and it was too, still too romanticized. So yeah, at the end of the day, if you want a book that better shows domestic abuse in a way that is not sexy, which by the way, it ends with us also has multiple sex scenes, which made me very uncomfortable because again, it's sexing it up and making it seem sexy and hot or something while at the same time showing that he's abusive and I get like I get with some people like the sex is part of it but I I still was really uncomfortable with the way that was written and again thinking of younger audiences I feel like that's a really dangerous thing for young people to be reading about and thinking that there's a part of them that's like ooh, like I can see why that would that would be exciting or something anyway I know this is a very rambly video so I apologize I'll try to fix it up in editing but anyway I highly recommend Big Little Lies I love that book so so much and I think it really puts you in the shoes of Celeste and there are other things going on within that book 
Facebook, so definitely look up trigger warnings, but you should also check out the video I was on for Ink to Film where we get into the details of that one. And yeah, let me know your thoughts on It Ends With Us down in the comments. I know a lot of people love this book and I know a lot of people hate this book. <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle of the road. I Even though I just went over all of my problems with it, I don't hate the book. I just have issues with it, you know? So yeah, share your thoughts down below in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you liked this video, then I will also link to the video where I talk about the book Layla. So I talk about it. It's the first part of this wrap up. So if you watch this wrap up video, Layla is the first thing I address. So go ahead and give that a watch too. And thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you next time. Bye.